So we will go straight to our lecture tonight. It's a talk on a little known 19th century English astronomer called William Lassell. Gerard Gilligan thinks he should be no better known and he's qualified to argue the case as he's chairman of the Society for the History of Astronomy in Birmingham. So I hope you all will enjoy this lecture. I'm really looking forward to it. And I hand you over now to Gerald. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you to Declan and Linda, and of course, Peter as well. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but perhaps one day we'll do that. The subject of tonight is William LaSalle. If I can correct pronunciation of his surname, the correct pronunciation is Lassell, um, but I prefer LaSalle. He fascinated me for many years, and uh, I hope to connect his astronomical accomplishments to the social and cultural side of Liverpool and the Northwest, which he was involved in. And of course, his brewing uh, business, which did actually pay for basically what was his hobby. Um, so the uh, structure of the talk tonight is basically his early life, uh, clocks, his brewing business, and early, his early telescopes. Then he soon, because of his fame, became the centre of the universe. And of course, the story connected to him involving the planet Neptune and Neptune's large satellite Triton. His meeting of Queen Victoria in 1851, and then at the end, his trips to Malta, the building of a 48-inch telescope, and then his retirement to Maidenhead in southern England, close to Windsor. Now, I would be drummed out of Liverpool if I did not mention the other Liverpoolian astronomer, Jeremiah Horrocks, famed, of course, for his prediction and observation of the transit of Venus on the 24th of November, 1639, old style, or the 4th of December, 1639, using the Gregorian calendar. And he's famed also for his lunar theory about the, the moon's orbit around the Earth, and also his tidal observations. But sadly, he died tragically very, very young, uh, at the age of 24, so he could possibly have gone on to even eliminate um, Isaac Newton uh, and gone on to great things, but it wasn't to be. Anyway, the story of Jeremiah Rex is another lecture, and that's another time. My interest about William LaSalle goes back to 1988, when Alan Chapman, who really should be here talking to you now, uh, produced this paper, William Lassell, 1799 to 1880, petitioner, patron, and grand amateur of Victorian ast astronomy. And that's what William Lassell is best described as, a grand amateur, a very wealthy man who was able to pour his money into his pastime or his hobby of astronomy. And it's a fascinating story in connection with, as I say, the social side of Liverpool in the Northwest. William Lassell is not a scouser. He was born in Bolton, Lancashire, on June 18, 1799. His father, Nathaniel, was a timber merchant uh, based in Bolton at the time of William Lassell's birth. William was educated in Bolton, then the Rochdale Academy, and the Lassell family were regarded as Congregationalists. His father died in 1810, and the family moved back to Liverpool in about 1815. The LaSalle family, his grandfather and his great-grandfather, were actually very established and well-known clock and watchmakers based at the time in Toxteth Park, which wasn't a suburb of Liverpool then. There was Thurston LaSalle, the great-grandfather of the astronomer, who was a clock and watchmaker, who lived between 1693 and 1758, and then William, again, his grandfather, who lived between 1736 and 1816. And there are many clocks uh, in existence around not just the UK, but also the world that have been uh, made by the LaSalle family, either the great-grandfather or William. 
Unfortunately, the name William crooks up quite a bit in the LaSalle family history. So at the time, it was very difficult to locate a person's identity because there were so many Williams. The examples of the long case clocks you can see here date between 1760 and 1790. And I have to say, I'm not a clock and watchmaking expert, but um, some of them are very ornately decorated and they have astronomical dials and lunaration dials, which you can see on the one in the middle. And if you do find any of these in an antique shop, then if you do have about £20,000 UK sterling, then snap it up if you can. Now, when the family moved to Liverpool in about 1815, William took up an apprenticeship in the brewing trade. And there is yet another William who was a wine merchant, who we think probably that's where the apprenticeship was taken up with. But by 1824, William uh, began his own business as a brewer in Milton Street, Liverpool. And by that time, there was uh, 600 breweries in the city when William started his business. The illustration you could see dates from about 1834, but actually gives you an idea of what a brewery looked like at about the time he started up in business. Even early on in his uh, business life, he met many influential people and one of them was Alfred King, who uh, became the gas engineer for Liverpool, another wealthy businessman. And Alfred and his brother Joseph were also keen astronomers. And William had a three-inch uh, reflector that he owned. And they would very often have astronomical star parties at the bottom of William's garden. And this went on for a few years. And through this relationship, astronomical relationship with Alfred, William met his sister, Maria, and they were married in 1827. And they had, I think it was four daughters and one son. And Maria was with him for nearly 80 years of his life. Now we have to make the first connection really between astronomy and the social and business side of Liverpool. And this was through the docks. As you know, Liverpool is probably best known as a tidal river trading port. And in certain aspects of its life, it almost outshone London. I know at the time its trading with the world was better than Bristol and some of the eastern maritime ports as well. But because it was a tidal river port, it needed tidal docks. And this is where uh, Jesse Hartley comes in, a very accomplished and wealthy engineer and was responsible for most of the docks being built in Liverpool. The most famous one, the Albert Dock, was opened in 1846, and 17 docks were built in Liverpool between 1830 and 1860 as the port expanded and got bigger. And five docks opened in just one year, 1848. Prince Albert travelled to Liverpool to open Albert Dock in 1846. To make these docks work, it needed dock workers, and they needed a thirst to be quenched and that's where William came in as a brewer. Instead of the dock workers going to the beer, the beer went to the dock workers to keep them on site. And that's how LaSalle made his wealth, because of the growing port, with not just its dock workers and sailors and immigrants. It was everybody else connected with the tidal port of Liverpool. And it seems interesting enough to connect when docks were being built to when LaSalle was able to afford and manufacture and build his three great telescopes, which I'll say more in a moment. This is a modern day map, but gives you an idea of how many tidal docks were in Liverpool between about 1750 to a modern day and 1972, when the container dock was first opened. Being a tidal river, ships originally would come into a dock and they would unload, but they would have to wait for the water to come back into the river before they could sail out, especially those cargo ships that had low drafts. And when they were full of cargo, of course, they were even lower in the water. So they needed to be brought into a dock, and they had the ability then with a tidal dock to unload them over a certain amount of time and then keep them in the dock. And then when the water flowed back into the river, they were able to sail out and off to their destination. Liverpool is not just famous for its docks, 
It was a shipbuilding hub as well for the Northwest and the world. It was also a major center for immigration. And as you probably know, uh, one of the biggest immigration events that Liverpool was connected with was, of course, the Irish potato famine. But most immigrants, believe it or not, came from Scotland uh, seeking work. And Liverpool was the center of all that. But if they didn't stay in the northwest of England, of course, they sailed off to either Europe or America. The map on the right-hand side, even though it dates from the 1950s, gives an indication of the railway system. Of course, the goods had to be shipped from the manufacturing hub of the northwest, like Bolton, Manchester, even as far away as Leeds. And they were also brought by canal, and they all came to Liverpool and of course was shipped away to many, many places all over the world. And because of this growing tidal port that Liverpool was, between about 1830 and 1860, it was uh, not surprisingly enough, but that someone in the business of brewing beer and quenching the thirst of all these Liverpool visitors became very wealthy, and that's what happened to William Russell. Now, to give you an idea of the brewing situation in Liverpool at the time. To explain what LaSalle was as a brewer, he was a common brewer. He produced about 1,000 barrels of beer a year and at different grades, six, eight and ten pence. The Beer Act of 1830 repealed the duty on strong beers and cider, permitting free trade in beer and cider. Nearly 25,000 licenses were taken out of England within six months. 800 beer shops opened in Liverpool alone in 19 days of the new act coming into force. And by 1840, Liverpool had 2,500 brewers, each supplying their own beer shop, gin palace, public house or brothels, which sold beer and other things. But if you want to know more, there's an excellent book down there that I've referenced about the British brewing industry. But again, this gives you an idea of what made uh, LaSalle wealthy and to pour, and I literally mean pour, his money into astronomy. Now his first great observatory was Starfield, which was just outside the city limits as today in West Derby Road. And it really did become the center of the universe between about 1830 and 1855. Now this is an illustration of Starfield House in West Derby dated about 1857, but gives you an idea of the grandeur of the house that LaSalle had built for him. It was actually later used in a typhoid epidemic as a hospital and uh, was noted to have 28 bedrooms, so it must have been very substantial. You can just about see what looks like two observatories, both on the left and the right side of the building. These two maps, one from 1851, and 1905 shows an indication of whereabouts uh, Starfield was situated. In 1851, as you can see, he was surrounded by literally farmland. But the later map of 1905, uh, the city had grown quite considerably, and many areas were now residential. Highlighted in the 1905 map is actually called Starfield Street, and the name was honoured even by the Victorians. But he had an ideal situation for his observatory in the early 1800s anyway. The site that he chose for Starfield was very, very good. As you can see from the illustration I said before, we think that um, this artist has actually recorded what we think are the two domes. One housed his nine-inch telescope, again manufactured by himself. He wasn't using optical mirror glass as we would today. It was actually speculum mirror. It was highly polished mirror metal optics, and of course they were very, very heavy. And the nine inch that he built, the first one, was tested by Luther Dawes, who was regarded as, I think, eagle eye, because of his uh, optical and observational skills. And in time, of course, at Starfield, Lassell had a nine inch in a very fine observatory, and then his middle telescope, the most famous one, the 24 inch, was also housed literally at the bottom of his garden. And there are some tremendous stories. In the Victorian age, when you had a dinner party, 
At the end, the ladies would go off to perhaps do some uh, crocheting or hear someone play the, the harpsichord or piano. And the men would go off to the drawing room to talk about business of the day and smoke their cigars. Not in the William LaSalle household. Everybody was invited down to the bottom of the garden. And if the sky was clear, they would use either the nine inch or the other one if it was available, the 24 inch telescope. And that would include the ladies as well. Now, this is a very fine illustration report that LaSalle wrote himself from presented to the Royal Astronomical Society on April the 7th. 1841. This is the nine inch, his first great telescope in a very fine observatory. And everything was manufactured by himself, engineered, designed. He had his own workshop. He was able to produce four or five main mirrors for his telescopes. And if he wasn't satisfied with a main mirror, he would simply take it out of the telescope, polish it a little bit more, and then put it back in again. And he was also a very accomplished eyepiece manufacturer as well. Now, before long, he made himself fairly well known, especially in Liverpool. And he was approached to help the Liverpool Docks Board to develop and establish an observatory. It opened in 1844 in Waterloo Dock on the Liverpool side of the river. The main aim of the observatory was to calibrate chronometers and to make sure that they were keeping time so that they could be taken on board ship. And of course, they were associated with ships, making sure they navigated correctly with longitude and latitude. John Chattenham Hartnup was the first director of the observatory and was actually recommended to the Liverpool Docks and Harbour Board by LaSalle himself. He'd been part of the committee that had the observatory established. Ironically, the Waterloo Dock needed to be expanded because Liverpool was growing all the time as a maritime port. So unfortunately, the observatory had to close and move over the river to what was the Bidston Observatory, which is opened in the 1860s. Now, before that, there was a lighthouse on the world, but uh, the observatory was established on Bidston Hill, which is a promontory and used for flag signalling as well as the lighthouse itself. It's where Bidston Observatory is today. Bidston itself has a very long history to do not just with astronomy and uh, transit telescope measurements, but also tidal uh, observations and predictions. And one of its most famous jobs was to predict the tides that helped the D-Day landings in the Second World War. Now, an Irish connection for you. William LaSalle wanted to really make very large telescopes because he wasn't satisfied with the smallish ones, even three inch or in nine inch. So the person who you could actually visit and gain very good advice and help with uh, doing this was William Parsons, the third Earl of Roscoe, who lived between 1800 and 1867. And I'm sure you know him well and his famous transit Leviathan telescope at Burr Castle, the 72-inch 52 focus. What LaSalle wanted to do was to find out how William Parsons was able to polish very large specular metal mirrors. And he noticed that a lot of the machinery that William Parsons used was made out of wood and actually imitated the way the human hand would polish mirrors and William LaSalle wanted to duplicate that motion by using mechanical means via automated polishing machines, pulleys, and even steam power. So after his visit to Ireland, he came back to Liverpool and designed and had manufactured several different types of automated mirror making machines, which he placed in his workshops. Some of them were operated by pulleys and steam, and some used horsepower in the same way some horses would be used for grinding corn and different plant materials. Uh, LaSalle would use the same sort of techniques as well. These mirrors were tested by different observers, uh, like William with the doors, and um, he would have a fairly easy access to foundries and to other metal manufacturing workshops in and around Liverpool because of the docks and the associated machinery and railway uh, workshops that Liverpool uh, had as well. 
So the ability to make these machines was very easy, and that uh, William Sell's fingertips. He had the ability to make these telescopes. He had the money. William Rutherdoors had the eyesight. His nickname was Eagle Eye because of his observational skills. But it was the Scottish engineer, James Naismith. His uh, ability and know-how and knowledge about uh, engineering manufacturing, he's famous for inventing the steam hammer. And he had a, a very large metal foundry at Pentecroft in Manchester, so he wasn't too far away. So the combination of these three men, LaSalle with the money, Brother Doors with the optical expertise, and Naismith with the metalwork know-how and engineering, it was a great combination, and it resulted in what became LaSalle's three great telescopes. And he had the uh, manufacturing establishments to make these telescopes, but he used the know-how of these two other gentlemen to accomplish it. Now, these photographs are of a replica 24-inch telescope that we had built to celebrate the 150th anniversary of not just the planet Neptune, but also its large satellite Triton. And I'll say a bit more about this later on, but this gives you an idea of the size of um, the 24-inch that LaSalle had built. And it gives you another idea of the observatory, not just for the 9-inch, the smallest one he had built, but also the 24. You needed to have a great head for heights to reach the eyepiece, especially if your object was in the zenith part of the sky. Uh, you were 50, 60, perhaps more feet above the ground um, when you were at the eyepiece. So basically, the 9-inch was upgraded to the 24-inch by LaSalle. His middle telescope is his most famous one. He just made everything bigger. If he needed to test the telescopes, he would take out the optics and do a little bit more polishing and then put the main uh, object mirror back into the telescope. And these are a few bits and pieces of the 24-inch that still exist. Unfortunately, the, the main telescope is no longer with us. As I said earlier on, he was a very accomplished eyepiece uh, maker. You can see there one of the 24-inch uh, metal mirrors that uh, still have its uh, reflective luster. And the uh, telescope there that you can see is actually the finder for the 24-inch telescope. And the story is, I can tell you, that it was found in a skip about to be thrown away by Curates of Liverpool Museum, and he recognised where it was and actually rescued it. So it's now uh, back in the object store at Liverpool Museum. Uh, all these were on show not so long ago when the Liverpool Museum had its space and astronomy gallery refurbished, but they had to be put away again in storage uh, when the display case for the cell had to be removed so that the museum could make room for a wheelchair lift. Now, eventually, going forward in time a little bit, when LaSalle died, his daughters, Jane and Caroline, who were both accomplished astronomers themselves, donated the telescope and one of the domes to the Greenwich Observatory. So this gives you an idea of the substantial observatory which was literally down the bottom of LaSalle's garden, all manufactured and built by himself. The LaSalle telescope at Greenwich was used until about 1896, until it became a bit too much to use and was actually broken up. Uh, but it gave a few years to many British astronomers in London at the time. Now we move on to a very interesting part of LaSalle's history and really what made his name uh, in the end was his discovery of Neptune's moon Triton. Neptune itself was first discovered from the Paris Observatory on the 23rd of September, 1846. But if LaSalle had not had a sprained ankle, he probably would have been the first English astronomer to observe the new planet from England, and not long after it was seen at the Paris Observatory. When he was well enough and able to use the 24-inch telescope, uh, LaSalle instantly saw the disk of Neptune and then he saw a 13th magnitude star which seemed to keep pace with the planet as well. 
so identifying it as a satellite. But interestingly enough, the cell also noticed that the planet itself was elongated, and to him that indicated it had a ring system just as intense and as thick as the one round Saturn. For a few years, he distinguished it as a ring system around Neptune and got several other observers around the UK using dis different instrumentation to have a look at Neptune. And they also saw that Neptune was elongated, uh, indicating a ring system. Now, what happened later when LaSalle was actually observing from Malta is he still wasn't certain that it was a ring system. So what he did was he literally grabbed hold of the tube of the 24 inch and rotated it and the ring system rotated along with the distortion of the planet. And what it turned out to be is of course he was still using metal mirrors and it was the weight of the mirror uh, distorting itself which was producing the optical illusion of uh, this phantom uh, ring around Neptune. He corrected this optical mistake by inserting levers at the bottom of the uh, mirror so that he could adjust the mirror so that it wouldn't flex to cancel out this distortion. Now, if, if LaSalle could have seen these pictures from Voyager 2 uh, from 1989, then he would have been uh, pretty astonished um, to see the large moon that he had first observed with its nitrogen geysers. And it, it took a spacecraft uh, flying past the planet itself to actually see that it did in fact have a ring system, a very thin ring system, which could only be illuminated by backlighting with the sun as a spacecraft flew past the Neptune system. But um, I'm glad to say that the International Astronomical Union um, heard about the story of the distorted and optical problems and have named one of the rings after LaSalle himself. Now, LaSalle was in constant competition with an American astronomer based in Massachusetts in the Boston Institute, William Crouch Bond. Bond was also associated with tidal uh, work as well and chronometers. So they got to know each other quite well through, of course, letters. And Bond was always getting to a discovery just a few hours after LaSalle. And one of them was to do with Hyperion, one of the moons, I think, of Saturn because Bond had 15 degrees of extra sky to play with than LaSalle, and it would always just frustrate him. So I think LaSalle got a bit fed up with the Liverpool skies because the port was growing as a manufacturing base all the time, and he moved out. But before then, his fame even got to royalty. In October 1851, their royal highnesses, Prince Albert and Queen Victoria visited Liverpool on apparently a very rainy day. And they stayed in Croxteth Park, which at the time wasn't that far away from where William Lassell lived. And the royal couple asked for Lassell to be placed on the guest list for when they stayed at Croxteth Park, which was the home of the Earls of Sefton. And they were good friends with the royal family. Now, uh, they had a dinner party on the night of October the 9th, and LaSalle was one of the guests. And apparently when LaSalle entered the room, the royal couple rose to greet LaSalle. And as you may be aware, that Prince Albert was very interested in both science and engineering himself, so wanted to know more about the telescopes. And the royal couple were hoping that LaSalle could have brought one of his telescopes to Croxet for them to look through. But of course, it was not possible. Um, however, it gives you an indication of the fame that the cell uh, was now in. And any astronomer in the world at the time, whether it be from America or Europe, if they were in England for any kind of astronomical uh, meeting where they could share papers and research, on their way home, whether it be possibly from Dublin, Edinburgh or London, they would head for Liverpool and uh, go and meet uh, LaSalle and talk to him. Um, LaSalle was fed up with the industrial smoke um, and factories and the atmosphere. He was not getting many clear nights from the weather anyway. 
So he moved to another purpose-built residence, Bradstones, which you can see here, were fortunately being knocked down to make way for housing. But as you can see, another marvellous, very big residential place. Uh, and again, on the grounds of this mansion, he built and tested his telescopes using the uh, chimneys of some of his friends who were in the, uh, not just the brewing business, but also uh, were ship manufacturers, tobacco, any kind of cotton factories that they owned. They all lived within this area of Sunfield Park, which you can see on this map. And I put a ring around Bradstones, and he would use his telescopes to look at the chimneys, even though they may be miles away, to test his optics. Now, a very sad story connected with the cell is the fact that his son, also William, who did actually look after the brewery when his dad was away observing the night sky. He predeceased them in 1875, but it appears that his son William went mad uh, through this Victorian social disease of syphilis. And this is a, a newspaper cutting that describes the court case to establish if William's son William uh, was compus mentis and uh, uh, was well enough to look after the business. William's son was sent to a, a lunatic asylum in Scotland, and that's where he died. But um, the thing I wanted to say was that if you're ever doing any kind of astronomical history research, never give up, because I actually found this quite by accident when I was looking through Scottish newspapers to see if there was any relatives of LaSalle living in Scotland and found this. So uh, it was something I never realised was part of his family history. And I thought that the reason his son died in Scotland was because he was connecting up with the whiskey distillery industry. Because, um, as I say, both son and father were in the brewing business. But unfortunately, it wasn't the case and it was a, a tragic end. LaSalle really got fed up with uh, English weather and uh, decided to move to Malta. Now, Malta was a staging post of the Crimean War, so it was quite well equipped with ports and uh, defended by English garrisons. So that's where he decided to move everything, and I mean everything, telescope, household. The ship that you can see down the bottom, the, the Cunard liner SS Damascus, I've seen the cargo listing for the first sailing when he went out to Malta in 1851. The LaSalle family had 260 packing cases plus a grand piano which went out to Malta and this was his first visit and the 24 inch believe it or not was set up in Malta and he had sometimes over 200 nights of clear sky to look at uh, the outer planets and the outer planets were his main interest. He wasn't really a deep sky observer or a lunar observer, he was a, an outer planet observer. However, as I will mention in a moment, he, he had an interest when he could in deep sky objects. He built a massive, his third massive telescope was a 48 inch telescope with a very revolutionary skeleton tube so that the warm air of Malta, the Maltese climate, could easily circulate and wouldn't cause distortion. It didn't have any kind of dome, it was outside. It had a huge tower which you could utilise to gain to the eyepiece and the lift system. And sometimes you'd have the situation where the astronomer was at the eyepiece, but shouting down observations to an observer or even his daughters to make uh, notes and diagrams. And I understand because of the weight of the bearings, he had a special operating system with a platform, as you can see on the image on the left-hand side, and had the Maltese Navi operating a lever so that the whole platform would move in time to the object he was observing, in time to a metronome, a piano metronome. This is a site at Trujillo, which is this prominency here. Unfortunately, the encroachment of modern-day hotels and villas has now spoiled the site, but it, it was a prominence that used to come right out into the bay, so he had perfect views of the night sky and was an ideal place to sight very large telescopes like the 24-inch and later the 48-inch. 
This is an example of the optics he was using. These were mirrors from the 48-inch secondaries, which were found quite by accident in the Whipple History Science Museum in Cambridge, I think in 1974. The box they were in was actually ignored for years because curators in the museum thought that it was a lady's hat box. But when someone's curiosity overtook them, they opened the box and found that it was a mirror with a handwritten note inside in LaSalle's own handwriting saying when it was last published and how good it was and what kind of ideal views of the night sky it could give you. And of course, he labelled it Mirror B. And he would have sometimes uh, an A, B, C and D mirror and would interchange them depending on how good uh, they would view the, the, the objects for him. Now, at one stage in Malta, he employed uh, what was termed at the time a calculator or basically an assistant astronomer. He employed Albert Marth, who was a German astronomer, um, and worked with him for a number of years in Malta. Albert, on occasion, had some very lucky nights because, of course, Lasseau was still being visited by the hoi polloi of the Victorian society, even in Malta, and would have to have big dinner parties. So William would turn to Albert and say, I don't need to use the telescope tonight, it's all yours. So I could see Albert running down the hill to the observatory and utilising the great power of either the 24-inch or the 48-inch to look at the night sky. Between them, they actually produced a paper uh, about the observations, 600 nebulae, uh, globular clusters, maybe galaxies, and it was all down really to Albert, who did all the observations. But Lassell put his name first on the paper that was presented to the Royal Astronomical Society. These illustrations give you an idea uh, of the views that um, the 24-inch mainly was giving Lassell. He was a very accomplished observer, not just in illustrating and doing the drawing of himself. And his daughters, Jane and Caroline, were, were accomplished observers as well. So not only was he doing drawings of uh, the outer planets, and Saturn, I think, was his favourite object, he would also make uh, copious notes of what he saw. And uh, I think he's, well, he is famous for making uh, certain observations of the crepe ring of Saturn, and I think one of the gaps as well he observed for the first time using his telescopes in Malta. But it gives you an illustration of the views he was having and uh, what he could see. Now, after his second visit to Malta, um, he brought the 48 inch back to Britain. His son was actually well enough to look after the brewery, but he decided to retire to Maidenhead in Southern England and allowed uh, his son to carry on looking after the brewery, but unfortunately his son predeceased him. Now this is Ray Lodge. This is the first residence that he didn't have built himself. It was already built when he moved in. And uh, these are a, a photographs I took in when I was visiting it in 1993 as part of the replica telescope uh, project. And when I was there, believe it or not, if you remember, LaSalle was a brewer. He had an apprenticeship in the wine industry. He was associated with alcohol. When I was in Maidenhead in 1983, this residence was being converted into a Betty Ford clinic for alcoholics. He became president of the Royal Astronomical Society in his latter years, between 1870 and 1872. And these, I think, are all the same sitting for the photographer. His clothing are all very similar. The portrait on the right-hand side is probably the presidential one. As you can see, the one on the left gives you an indication of the bags under the eyes. So someone who had many, many late nights, and it wasn't probably suitable to be a presidential portrait. I was probably doctored a little bit by the Victorian photographer. Um, but these gives you an illustration of what he looked like in his latter years. And when I was doing the project for the replica telescope in the 1990s, I also located the living descendants of LaSalle, and one of them was Elizabeth Blackster, who several times removed was, I think, his great niece. Um, and she had certain artifacts from 
LaSalle still in their possession, and one of them was this beautiful brooch or a wedding case gift with those monogram on the front, uh, WL. But when you opened it, uh, there was a photograph of him and actually a lock of his hair. And Alan Chapman jokingly said to me after a meeting once, it would be remarkable if we could take the hair and do some Jurassic Park know-how with the DNA and have many, many LaSalle's running around the country building telescopes. Well, LaSalle's health gave out and he died in Maidenhead in 1880 in October. And it was literally, sadly for me anyway, because it was a year later that my own Astronomical Society Liverpool was established. And if he'd lived just a few more years, I'm sure he would have become uh, an honorary president, but he would certainly have been involved in the society in a place that he was associated with astronomy many, many years. And um, he's buried in St. Luke's graveyard in Maidenhead, if you're ever in England and you want to see where he is. But over the years, his grave had got overgrown and was not looked after at all. Um, so Maidenhead Astronomical Society took it upon themselves to do some reservation. And uh, now his re last resting place is well looked after and maintained. And Maria, his wife, followed him into the same grave two years after his own death. So um, I've spoken for nearly an hour, so I'll just come to an end to go over the accomplishments that LaSalle is associated with. He was one of the first, I think, to see the sixth star of the trapezium in M42, the great nebula of Orion. That was 1842. Of course, he was the discoverer and the first observer of uh, Neptune's main moon, chief moon, Triton, 1846. And we celebrated its 175th anniversary uh, this year. He saw uh, Saturn's eighth satellite Hyperion in 1848, again with Bond of uh, Harvard. Uh, discovered Saturn's crape ring in 1850, again with both Dawes confirmed the discovery and Bond was a fellow discoverer. Found Uranus's two faint moons, Ariel and Umbril, in 1851, and they weren't background stars, they were confirmed later on as moons of Uranus. And together with Marth in Malta, catalogued 600 nebulae and had the paper published in 1866. And of course, he designed and constructed some of the largest speculum mirror equatorial telescopes of their day. Some historians describe the telescopes that he built as Hubble Space Telescopes or even James Webb Telescopes of their day, but they were massive. Uh, weighing in tons telescopes where you can literally move them with your finger if necessary. That's how fine the engineering was. And this is the replica telescope I told you about that we had constructed partially for the 150th anniversary back in 1996. And it's hard to believe that it's 25 years ago that we did this. We were hoping to have this replica telescope back on view again uh, last year and this year for, to celebrate the anniversary. But unfortunately, the pandemic stopped that happening. But there is going to be a limited display to do with the anniversary this year in Liverpool Museum, uh, which I'm hoping to be involved in. And to end with... This is an advert from Liverpool Echo from 1927 to advertise and illustrate the solar eclipse, the total solar eclipse that was seen over the UK in uh, June uh, 1927 and gives you an idea that Liverpool and brewing business and drinking beer still hasn't gone away. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed for your attention and being here tonight. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic, very, very, very enjoyable lecture. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Really Brilliant. enjoyed it. Thank you, Linda. Do you want to ask the questions, Declan? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, lots and lots in the comment section there of uh, thanks and how enjoyable and fascinating the lecture was, even I see one all the way from Vienna. Personally, I, I love the link with the beer, and definitely that's something we need to look into <laughs> further, I think. I think we'll have to talk to our uh, observers group, John, uh, and suss that out. Also fascinating, um, George, you mentioned 
um, that he could attach a lever to the bottom of his telescope to correct the aberrations so things weren't looking spherical. And I mean, I always thought adaptive optics were a new invention, but obviously been around for quite some time. No, I think it was, I'm sure I'm correct in saying that it was um, James Naismith who developed the system because he was an accomplished telescope manufacturer and, and observer himself. Right. Um, and he just gave the know-how to LaSalle. And um, Naismith's telescopes can be viewed in the, uh, the Science Museum storage. And uh, during the replica telescope uh, project I mentioned, some of the members of the project were able to take the mirror cell out of LaSalle's um, Naismith's telescope and examine the levering system. And as you quite rightly described it, Declan, it was a, a, a sort of active optics uh, mm -hmm. method that they used simply to overcome the uh, fact that the metal speculum mirrors did cause problems when they were viewing objects uh, high up in the night sky at the zenith. I think LaSalle had that problem mainly when uh, Saturn was fairly high in the sky which may have been the case around the time of the Neptune discovery. So, first question, uh, Paul Murphy. Did William Lassell have any part in the naming of Triton? No, I think it was um, a number of years later. Of course, there was no International Astronomical Union at the time, but I think a French astronomer, uh, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing his name properly, Carillion, he suggested the name Triton to carry on with the, um, the Greek and the, uh, the Romanesque um, naming of planets as such. So um, Triton was, I can't remember, I'm sure someone in the audience will know the Greek connection uh, with Neptune and Triton, but uh, it was the association in Greek mythology between the two. I suppose Neptune being the god of the sea and Triton as the kind of three-pronged spear he holds, isn't I it? I think so, yeah. So that, was, well, that, that was a tri trident. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was a... He may have been the son of Neptune. I, I'm sure someone will tell me. I'll Google it later. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, interesting question from Colm. Uh, why do you think William Lassell did not get more recognition given his accomplishments? Surely he should be well remembered for his discovery of Triton alone. Well, believe it or not, um, 30 years ago, I didn't know who William Lassell was, even though at the time I did have an astronomical interest. I think the best way to answer the question is that the Victorians were fascinated with Jeremiah Horrocks' history, and Lassell was virtually overlooked. And it wasn't until recent times, and I mean, I do mean recent times, within the last 30, 40 years, that LaSalle got any kind of recognition um, in Liverpool. He's had roads and things like that named after him, but more so Horrocks. Horrocks has got numerous Victorian memorials around Liverpool, but LaSalle's astronomical accomplishments were well recorded, but not his, the social bearing so it may have been that, depending on the politicians at the time who may have had influence about establishing memorials, etc. They just didn't connect LaSalle in the same way to Liverpool as Horrocks was, because Horrocks was a true Liverpoolian, you know, Scouser, as I said, but LaSalle wasn't. However, having said that, the LaSalle family were all well established in Liverpool as clock and watchmakers. So it's an interesting question, and uh, it, it is something that uh, has only been corrected recently. One question from Steve O'Flynn, which kind of touches on what you were saying there. Uh, curious about the name LaSalle. It doesn't sound very English. Yeah, Alan Chapman's um, suggested that it was. Um, it might be French. The LaSalle surname is, I first found a family uh, going back to the 1500s, so they may have come over from France, it's a possibility. It, it, it's something I've not really looked into that much. But Alan Chapman suggested it's, it's French sounding. There was a lot more LaSalle families in Southern England, and they have actually 
uh, left France during the revolution to get away from the revolution, but they were a bit later than the Williams ancestors. Okay. Um, Gary is wondering, any reason why he didn't use a refractor, why he always seemed to use reflectors? I think he just uh, had the ability to make them better. It's uh, interesting to note that in his later life, he, nearly, he never really dabbled in any kind of primitive astrophotography. He did prefer, you know, the mirror-type telescopes, which he probably had more control over in making. And he may have felt that um, he might have had to go to another manufacturer. But then again, as I said, he uh, was a well-known and established uh, eyepiece maker himself. I just think he, he was able to get better results than, uh, than utilising them than the other. John Burgess reminds us the, the link here in Cork between astronomy and brewing. Uh, Beamish and Crawford, uh, very famous and still is a uh, brewery here in Cork City. And the observatory in UCC is uh, the Crawford Observatory. They actually funded it and it's got um, a, a very, very famous group telescope in there, which some of our members, Gary and Jan and Lee, have been doing a lot of work on before COVID put a, put a stop to it. Another one. John Cuthbert, can you tell us a little about the Liverpool Astronomy Society? Might need to know before our visit because several people have suggested it sounds like a great place to visit. Well, uh, the uh, Liverpool Society was established in 1881 and for 10 years of its early life, it was only second to the Royal Astronomical Society. In 1885, it actually held a meeting, joint meeting with the Royal Society. And um, when it sort of collapsed in on itself and went local, the British Astronomical Association came about. So Liverpool is the parent society to the national organisation here in the UK. And although we sort of limped along in the early part of the 20th century and the two world wars intervened as well, we regard ourselves as the oldest amateur astronomical society in the world. We had branches in Australia and Brazil. And in, uh, I think, 1883, the Emperor of Brazil was actually an honorary member. And the story is, and I, uh, I'd like to tell you the story, that he was over in Europe uh, at the invitation of Queen Victoria. And he was very, very much interested in astronomy and was visiting as, uh, the observatories that were established at the time. But when he went back to Brazil, he was assassinated, unfortunately. Um, we think he was in Brazil, but other historians think it happened in Europe. We have to tell members, new people who join our society today, that you won't be assassinated when you join. So um, that's the thing we have to make sure of. For the first 10 years, between about 1881 and 1890, we were one of the, the, the biggest and uh, well-known society, astronomical societies in the country. We weren't the first, I have to admit that. There was one in Glasgow as early as 1803, which was called an astronomical society. But I think Liverpool was one of the best established. And societies nowadays have directors that look after, say, lunar, planetary, solar telescope construction that's the way liverpool was was constructed in 1881 and uh, even if you lived in say north america if you wanted your observations broadcast the entire world you had your scientific paper read out at a meeting of liverpool astronomical society it's actually the last question there and um, john burgess how did he make his very large a reflector scope rotate with the Earth's rotation in 1865? Was it purely manual or given his connection with uh, clock making, was it automated? It, it was a, a manual mechanism. The paper to do with the 48 inch is, um, you can actually view it, I think, online. And it gives a, a detailed description of the platform that it rested on. and. It was basically um, a circular railway bogey, um, but the way it was constructed, you could use it uh, in a timed way to uh, mimic and um, 
cancel out the Earth's movement so something would stay in the field of view uh, for a length of time. Um, I don't know the ins and outs, but uh, it, uh, the story is that he had this workman type motorized platform uh, that he could use to rotate this huge big telescope weighing tons on, on bearings uh, to move in time um, and to, to change its declination and that right ascension as well. Anybody else got anything? Just feel free, just jump in. Is there still a La Salle brewery in Liverpool? No, however, um, there was one in North Wales to do with the son who, as I say, tragically passed away in 1875. There was a La and Charmin brewery in North Wales up until about uh, 1896 and it was taken over by Greenalls. I don't know if you've heard of that brewery before. And they took over the brewery. Um, but there isn't no sign uh, of the breweries in Liverpool now. Where the Milton Street Brewery was, his first brewery, is now the entrance to the Mersey Ro uh, Road Tunnel. That's very interesting. It's incredible the links you were able to make from your original discovery. Uh, from La Salle to all the to his son to Scotland uh, yes. to the to the ship uh, the cargo manifest everything it's incredible piece of detective work you've done I really enjoy it thanks very much thank you it, it's um, as I say it was um, if I may the true story is that uh, it came about because Alan Chapman gave uh, the first William La Salle Memorial Lecture at Liverpool. And we had a display about LaSalle at the back of the lecture theatre. And Alan was writing his, his article that I mentioned at the very beginning of my presentation. And he wanted to know where we'd got the photograph of LaSalle from. And we got a copy for him. And then uh, he contacted me to fill in a few gaps. And I had access to Liverpool archives, to, which he didn't uh, because he lived in Oxford, of course, at the time. And um, believe it or not, I was researching my own family history and I, I found LaSalle's more interesting than my own. So I stopped doing my own and carried on doing LaSalle's, uh, which I found more fascinating. I, I'm still doing it now. In fact, uh, when my local archives library opened up again, I was viewing uh, LaSalle letters that he'd written to some of the uh, well-known and wealthy merchants within Liverpool and they were asking for his uh, advice about getting jobs for their sons. Um, so I'm still researching him even today. Well, I think we'd better finish our lecture. Really very interesting. So thank you very much again, Gerald, for this fantastic lecture. You're very welcome, Linda. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure.